I'm sorry, it's a little bit dark here. I thought it was afternoon. <laughs> uh, the welcome to our thematic session on uh, uh, FOSS uh, Smart Choice for the Developing um, uh, Countries. Uh, my name is uh, Omar Mansour Ansari, and I'm board director of the Open Source Alliance of Central Asia and president of the Tech Nation. Um, Open, Sor Open Source Alliance of Central Asia, or OSAKA, is um, a consortium of uh, open source software users in Central Asia, in South Asia, and Tech Nation is a technology firm based in Kabul that engages in community technology, community, media, incubator management, policy regulatory, advisory, and apps development. Uh, this workshop uh, raises awareness on open source software, uh, open standards, open systems, and open platforms, and uh, uh, open data in content. The panel includes uh, experienced leaders um, in open source. They're from Europe, Central Asia, in South Asia. Um, our speakers include Sunil Abraham, who's uh, a Bangalore-based uh, uh, entrepreneur. He founded Mahiti in 1999, which aims to reduce the cost and complexity of information communication technology for voluntary sector by using free software. Sunil is uh, currently uh, working and as uh, executive director of the Center for Internet and Society India. Uh, Dominic Lazansky, uh, she's a, a UK-based uh, digital policy and uh, strategy freelance consultant and works on digital uh, policy for GSMA. <coughs> and previously worked for uh, Taxpayers Alliance. She worked uh, in Silicon Valley for uh, Yahoo, eBay, and Apple. And uh, Dominic sits on the Open Data User Group board in the Cabinet Office and uh, the Tax um, uh, Transparency Board in HMRC in the UK. Uh, Roxana Radu. Uh, uh, she is a PhD candidate in the International Relations Political Science at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, Switzerland, and a research fellow at the Center for Media and Communication Studies, uh, Central European University in Hungary. She worked with uh, CM, uh, CMCS, ISOC, Open Society Foundation, and Global Development Network. The session will be around uh, um, one and a half hour long. Each speaker will have about uh, 10 minutes and we'll have uh, 40 minutes uh, for a Q&A and open discussion. Before we go to the speakers, I'd like to present some background on uh, free open source software. So uh, in order for uh, uh, those participants who uh, don't know much about the free open source software, uh, they know some uh, uh, information about what it is. Um, yep. Next. Um, as uh, you can see in the slide, the, uh, the first thing we need to discuss is opens, uh, open source and what it is. Um, um, there's something that can be modified because, it's, uh, because of its design is uh, publicly available. Uh, inaccessible. Uh, and uh, initially, uh, when software is created with source code available for modification or enhancement, it was called open source. And uh, open source, what does that mean when a software has its, uh, its source code open uh, for modification? That's called open source software. And source code, as you know, is uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the part of the program that's uh, not uh, uh, seen by the common user. Um, in uh, some software, this is open. Uh, developers can access it or the users can access it. In some software, they cannot access it. 
Like in software, you see file, the text file doesn't have the ability to uh, open a file or open or close a file, but there is a, a small program in the background that runs and gives uh, the text the ability to open a file. Open source, uh, uh, what are the different software? There's some software where uh, the source code cannot be modified by anyone but the person or team that has created the software. Uh, in uh, this software, um, the, the producer maintains exclusive control over the software. Uh, and they're called closed closed source or proprietary software. Examples are Microsoft Word and Photoshop C CS, as you see it on the on a picture. Um, in other type of software, the author uh, makes its source code available to others uh, where, uh, to view the code, copy it, learn from it, and uh, um, and alter it or share it with others. These softwares are called open source software free open source software or free libre open source software. And examples are um, uh, LibreOffice uh, and, and GNU uh, uh, image uh, manipulation program. Next. Okay. Um, open source is about license. Um, uh, in 1998, even before that, the idea came up that uh, the software source code needs to be open for, uh, uh, for modification and sharing and learning. Uh, that means that nearly unlimited right to read, modify, uh, and redistribute the source code. Um, uh, and this was um, uh, 1998 when the concept further developed and people started developing software where the source code is open to uh, different users. Next. <coughs> okay, open source software is not only about LibreOffice or, uh, or uh, GIMP. Uh, you would see a list of uh, uh, software like uh, MIFOS. This is a microfinance software. Uh, Miradi is uh, an environmental monitoring software. Uh, uh, Matas is a human rights worker source note-taking uh, software. Uh, Sahana disaster relief uh, coordination software. And school tool is for student information system, and there are um, hundreds of uh, software you can find um, uh, projects and list of software over the internet. Next. Why people use uh, open source software? Because they have uh, more control over their software, they can examine the code, and they can change uh, part of the, the software without uh, asking for permission and they can use the software for any purpose. Uh, uh, and uh, it helps them become better uh, programmers. Um, they can share their work with others. Uh, they can, um, uh, open source software is more secure and stable. Um, um, the user can view and modify parts of the, the program. And many programmers can work together uh, without taking uh, any permission from anyone on uh, developing or modifying the software. Um, and uh, uh, open source software is fixed and updated and upgraded uh, uh, quicker than the property software. And a very important uh, uh, aspect is that it encourages collaboration and community engagement. I think that's, that's all uh, uh, about the open source uh, background. So I'll go to our first speaker, uh, Dominic. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Dominic Lozanski. I work at the GSMA, uh, but most recently before that, I was at the Taxpayers Alliance, which is a civil society uh, group and think tank that campaigned for um, lower taxes and transparency. So as a, a result of that, I uh, joined the Open Data User Group, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, 
And the Open Data User Group is part of the UK Cabinet Office, which has the agenda for delivering um, transparency, which includes things like open data, um, accountability, government accountability, also uh, the gov Open Government Partnership, which I'll talk a little bit about towards the end of, of my uh, presentation. Um, so when the new government came into the UK in 2010, uh, open data and transparency was a, a quite a large push for them. They wanted to realize not only the benef economic benefits and economic growth benefits, but also uh, benefits to a wider society. So the Open Data User Group was founded uh, about just over a year ago, actually, in order to uh, put together a multi-stakeholder group to advocate for open data across government departments, primarily central government. And that multi-stakeholder group includes now, and in its second year, includes uh, civil society, um, big and small businesses, including startups, academics, as well as uh, government officials and uh, the charity sector too. So there's a, a wide range of people with a wide range of experiences. We had, to, uh, we had to apply to be on the group last year and the application process just happened again. It's a one year term. Uh, the chair is a three year term. So effectively though, even though we're aligned and sitting in the cabinet office, our remit is to, um, to, to push government effectively to, to really try and um, get as much data open as possible and advocate for that on behalf of all users, not just in business, but also civil society and across um, open data communities in the UK. So uh, we look at open data as being um, government held data that is taxpayer funded and would be licensed if opened under what we call the Open uh, Government License or OGL, which among other things means that it's free to, um, to reuse to everyone. So uh, as part of the whole process, this multi-stakeholder um, group, uh, we meet about once every six weeks approximately. Uh, over the summer it was a little more. Um, we have a very open and transparent um, process. So in order to apply, we had to apply openly and all of our applications went online publicly. Um, and then once we were accepted onto the program, um, everything was published, uh, including our, um, our interests, our backgrounds, uh, you know, what we want to get out of it. And also then all the meetings, which are held in various different locations. Uh, people volunteer their meeting rooms uh, on the group. Um, all of the notes and all of the um, minutes are uh, open and available for everyone to, to have a look at or to, to download if they want. So what do we actually do? We, um, we advocate, obviously, uh, data to be open that's held by the government. But how that works is through a process of um, both negotiation and business cases. And the business cases are really, really tricky because, as you know, Part of open data is you don't actually know what's going to happen or who's going to use the data um, until it's released. And so it's been quite a challenge because many of us on the board really believe that we should open as much as possible, including myself. We should open as much as possible and, and kind of see what happens and, and what becomes of that. But the government, especially the um, Inland Revenue and HMRC, are keen to understand what the possible economic benefits are as well as social benefits. So we've put together business cases for, um, for every kind of uh, data sets that we've been advocating for. And these data sets that we advocate to be released are data sets that have been requested by users. And again, that can be everyone from credit reference agencies, quite large groups, to you know, individual people who are, who are doing startups. So some examples of that over the last year, um, I've worked on the VAT registration, which is the value added tax registration data, not the actual financial data, but the registration data and metadata we advocated to be released. And I led the process for writing the business case for that and working with a number of companies, uh, credit reference agencies in particular, as well as about four or five startups in London who want the data um, in order to inform their business and the either for credit making, obviously, for credit reference agencies, or we have a number of small startups that are interested in um, trust online and interested in making products around uh, users who are able to understand what businesses are local to their areas. So it, as part of that process, I um, took feedback from 
everyone that I could gain feedback from, including uh, open data user group and um, possible people that would use the data. And I held um, an open meeting for people at, w we have an open data institute, um, and I held it there. And that's sort of an example of the process that we went through, and it was part of a wider consultation that we responded to and is now being reviewed by HMRC. And we will hear probably next month uh, about the results of, of that consultation. The other two um, I'm going to mention examples that Open Data User Group worked on was for us the postcode address file, which is the uh, nationally held and um, updated file for postcodes. But it's it's government created. It was created through Royal Mail, which has just gone private actually. But that data was created by taxpayer funds, and we've been advocating to release that file. Um, as you can imagine, a number of people are very interested and keen to have that op be open and available. It's available for quite an expensive license fee right now, so companies like Google and um, other professional mapping companies can use it, but there are a lot of people that are keen to have it to be able to, uh, to validate addresses, obviously, and make map products. Um, and finally, one other thing around that um, is historical land registry data, which uh, is really, really useful for individuals buying houses, but also for insurance and various other things. So we advocated for that to be free in the land registry, released historical data recently, and it was quite easy to do. They didn't even want a business case, they just did it. So we just worked with them to get that open as quickly as possible. Um, we have a lot of ongoing work uh, that you know, similar to the examples, uh, health data is a, is a big one right now because of the National Health Service. Um, but obviously there are tensions and a lot of balances we need to address in terms of privacy, which I think will be a big issue because we've released data sets that had no privacy implications over the last year, the government has at least. And coming up will be a lot more stickier and thornier issues around what are we going to do. And, and there are a lot of discussions going on, but from an open data user group point of view, we need to come to a, a decision collectively about how we're going to deal with that. Um, but all of this actually is a part of uh, a wider process going on in the UK. And um, the government across Whitehall and across central government is compiling a national information infrastructure. Um, so they have uh, a, a list, effectively, that they're asking each department to give to them that discusses data sets that, are, that they held that are either open or not open. Uh, this includes everything from the Ministry of Defense to uh, the Home Office to the Foreign Office. And the process of this is to identify all of the data that they might not know about, people might not know about, users might not be able to know about requesting. Um, this is part of the agenda to sort of uh, get the transparency agenda delivered before the next election. But it's been a, a really big um, process that's been going on. And the list, the official list, the full list, will be announced at the Open Gov Government Partnership Conference, which is the th October 31st and 1st. And the UK is, um, is the co-chair of the Open Government Partnership, which, as you know, uh, advocates across the world with a number of countries and organizations in countries from civil society and, and businesses as well as other for um, openness and transparency. So that conference is going to focus on best practices, but one of the subsets of that conference will be this, <coughs> this announcement from the UK government on the national information infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to stop there, but I just wanted to finally say one last thing. We, uh, the Open Data User Group and all the data requests as well as all the open data sets and eventually all the data sets identified under the National Information Infrastructure is available on data.gov.uk. Um, it's going through redesign right now, but if you have a look at that, you'll be able to see a lot more about, um, about open data in the UK. Thank you, Dominic. <coughs> now I'll um, go to our next uh, speaker, uh, Sunil. You have the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll uh, first uh, perhaps introduce you to the city I come from, uh, Bangalore. Uh, there are possibly uh, three cities that have their name in the English dictionary. Uh, the city of uh, Shanghai, and to be uh, Shanghai means that you were drugged and then kidnapped and then put on a ship as uh, slave labor. 
the second city is Coventry. Uh, to be sent to Coventry means that you've been sent to jail. And the third city in the English dictionary is the city of Bangalore. And to be Bangalore means uh, that you had a job in the developed world, and then you lost your job, and your job traveled to the developing world. Uh, so that's the city uh, I come from. Uh, unfortunately, despite its reputation as the Silicon Valley of India, uh, most of the people that work in the software industry are uh, cyber coolies or uh, cyber slaves. Uh, this is because uh, they are educated in universities where they are never taught the internals of operating systems or software. They are only taught how to operate uh, software. Uh, and therefore, uh, Bangalore's uh, business model is mostly based on labor arbitrage. Uh, the software companies in India don't produce any intellectual property. All the trademarks, trade secrets, and copyright associated to the products that they develop uh, belong to the companies that contract them uh, from the developed world. Uh, so when we introduce the concept of free software to these companies, they say, uh, why would we do that? How are we going to make money by using free software? What they don't realize is that Apple is the most successful free software company on the planet. Uh, Apple bases its product on a free and open source uh, software called BSD, and then there is a lot of free software packed into uh, Apple's operating system. It always ships with Python and uh, Apache and Samba, uh, but the proprietary layer on top of uh, the BSD operating system is what Apple owns intellectual property to. This is in complete compliance with uh, the free software licenses, and that is why Apple is not sued by the Software Freedom uh, Law Center. So therefore, for countries like India, which are way behind when it comes to generating their own intellectual property, uh, free software acts as a bootstrap mechanism. Uh, to get a viable business model going. Uh, the second reason why uh, Indian universities and engineering schools should teach free software, apart from turning computer operators into computer scientists, is to prevent the balkanization of the labor force. When you join a Bangalore-based software industry, uh, you're often asked to sign non-disclosure agreements. You are taught proprietary technology, often specific to that particular enterprise. Uh, when you leave that enterprise, your skills are completely useless. When you join the next enterprise, you have to sign another non-disclosure agreement, and uh, there is also no public record of your contribution, as could be the case if you were also contributing to a free and open source software project, apart from producing proprietary intellectual property. Uh, the important thing for us to remember in the Global South is that the government is a very important procurer of software, often uh, counts for 50% of the sales target of large proprietary software vendors, and therefore uh, software procurement policies uh, by the government can have a huge impact on configuring the domestic industry. Uh, these policies can be explicit policies, and there are uh, research organizations that have counted more than 290 free software policies, both at the national and uh, uh, st state level across uh, the world. But in India, we follow what we call perhaps a tacit free software uh, mandate. Uh, if we were to explicitly have a free software policy that might upset some of the proprietary software giants uh, that have partners with the Indian software industry. Uh, therefore, uh, occasionally the government will make some statements, but there is no explicit policy. Uh, the way this works is uh, 
it really helps on the negotiation table. So uh, the state of Tamil Nadu uh, pitched the free software vendor against the proprietary giant and was able to convince the proprietary giant to provide both the operating system and the default uh, office suite for uh, $1 each to reach the same price point offered by this free software competitor. So you have to ask yourself uh, as a nation whether you want an explicit policy uh, mandating free software under certain circumstances or whether you want a more ambiguous uh, non-stated policy as is the case with India that helps you on the negotiation table. Now, when is the case that in e-governance we cannot compromise on free software? Uh, let me give you an alternative definition of free software. Uh, free software is like my shirt. Uh, if uh, I want to wear it and uh, come to this meeting, I have the freedom to do so. If I want to take it to the beach, if I want to use it to go to the beach, that is absolutely fine. Uh, that's the first freedom, the freedom of use. Uh, suppose I decide that uh, this is a boring shirt. I don't like the color. I don't like the sleeves. I want to cut the sleeves off and dye it pink. Uh, I have the freedom to modify my shirt. Uh, that is uh, uh, the, the, the second freedom. If I want to change my job from a civil society activist at uh, internet governance forums and I want to become a fashion designer instead, I want to reverse engineer the shirt and understand how shirts are produced, then uh, again, I have that freedom. That is the third freedom. And uh, suppose uh, one of you came to this meeting shirtless and I felt that I would like to share my shirt with you, uh, either for free or for a fee, then I can share my shirt. Uh, that is my fourth and final freedom. Uh, the uh, first, the, perhaps the third freedom, or the second freedom, as uh, Richard Stallman would put it, the freedom to reverse engineer or study the code is the most important freedom when e-governance systems have implications on your status as a citizen. A very famous case from the US, a gentleman was driving under the influence of alcohol. Um, he was taken to court. Uh, evidence was provided from a proprietary breath analyzing uh, hardware, which uses proprietary breath analyzing software. Uh, the court dismissed the evidence, saying that if uh, there was no way of independently auditing uh, the code and arriving at the same conclusion that the person was drunk, uh, then this evidence would be non-admissible uh, in his court. So you can see uh, in certain areas it is super critical. Election voting machines is another area where uh, uh, this freedom within uh, free software is super critical. And in India, we have a very big free software project, uh, the Aadhaar project or the Unique Identity project built uh, completely on a free software stack. Uh, this project is supposed to provide centralized authentication and identification management based on biometrics. Uh, I have uh, serious reservations about that project, but uh, from a privacy perspective, uh, from free software, it sounds mostly like a good idea. But if you interrogate the pro project closely, you will come to the conclusion that the key component of the software is that part of the software that is responsible for identification and authentication is proprietary. And therefore, uh, it interferes with the most important uh, right in India to be a citizen of India. Uh, therefore, there are certain areas where uh, adopting free software is not an option for the government. It has to be the case. And in those specific cases, uh, civil society must push for mandates uh, so that it does not interfere with our fundamental human rights. Otherwise, projects like Aadhaar will get away with what I call open washing. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil, for the excellent presentation. Now we'll uh, move to uh, Roxana, our next speaker. Roxana, you have the floor. Thank you. 
Uh, my presentation will focus on women empowerment through free and open source software from a social perspective, outlining uh, the potential and the challenges uh, around involving more women developers uh, in FOSS. My intervention will discuss uh, this with reference to Eastern Europe and Central Asian context. And I will conclude with some directions for policy development that we can all uh, work towards, hopefully, in the near future. While the gender gap in access to internet varies massively across the world, uh, for the largest part of the developing countries, the percentage of women online is far lower than that of men online. Uh, in Eastern Europe and in Central Asia, approximately 30% fewer women than men have access to the internet. Uh, according to the recent uh, Women in the Web report, the reverse is happening in countries like France and the US, where women tend to uh, be more present online than men, so the numbers exceed um, that of um, male participants online. Yet, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, these gaps are larger than 45%. Uh, at the global level, it is estimated that more than 200 million girls and women are not connected to the internet at all, making this group 25% uh, less likely to be online. In this regard, it is important to look beyond the availability of the connection itself, um, and to take into account also the affordability of price, since this is one of the reasons why women are not uh, accessing uh, the internet um, at the same extent as um, men are, for example. Currently, for the Commonwealth of Independent States, the price of the average broadband monthly subscription um, reaches 7.3% of the annual per capita income, with relatively great disparities between uh, the rural and the urban areas. Um, first, in terms of uh, broadband availability itself, and second, in terms of gender roles in the house, um, as in men being the um, person to be bring the, um, the money in the family and thus decide on how the family income should be spent. Apart from the physical connection that facilitates access to the internet, there's also a need to investigate the engagement of women with the use and the development of software. As we know, software is not neutral, but rather gendered in both design and use, thus embedding a series of um, behavioral standards. In 2006, according to a study of the European Commission, only 1.6% of all FOSS developers in the EU were women. This is lower than 2% and thus relatively worrisome, uh, especially compared to proprietary software. Um, since for the latter, women engagement reached 28% for the same time period that the survey investigated. Um, the FOSS community, of course, has a lot to gain from uh, the different approaches that women might take to software development, and I'm gonna uh, discuss these ones uh, subsequently. This potential is almost completely sidelined at um, the present moment by a series of challenges posed to women developers. First, the main pressure is thinking through the cycle of disparities um, to ensure that technology is developed, uh, keeping in mind the community at large. And this is also thinking of those who, are, uh, who need it the most, which is low-income populations as well as uh, rural-based populations. The second challenge would be overcoming the restrictive gender norms in certain parts of the world and going beyond the myth of technophobia, that women are less technologically savvy than men are. In this case, developing a context that is fostering women's involvement would be probably the most successful avenue for increasing the number of women in FOSS. And there is also a third major challenge, which is that of including more women in decision and policy-making processes as women are able to speak uh, to a relatively different audience than men are, are also able to think through the challenges posed to the larger communities, look at the benefits for the next generations, as well as bringing diversity and innovate in unexplored ways, if given a seat at the table and a voice in the process. At the same time, women empowerment understood as the capacity to alter structural conditions uh, in order to govern oneself in the best interest, presupposes that women are not treated as a monolithic group, that they are not treated as being all the same, but rather uh, need to be seen as a diverse group, revealing the differences 
across cultures and across uh, contexts. Regionally, for the um, Commonwealth of Independent States, we have a configuration of um, structural conditions that reflect both the potential and also the pitfalls of uh, advancing women empowerment in FOSS. On the one hand, there are very high literacy rates with uh, only slight variation by gender and almost the entire population uh, is literate in these countries. On the other hand, the computer education lags behind with the materials taught in school being most of the times basic or even outdated, meaning that those who consider doing a career in uh, developing software need to do a lot uh, of work by themselves, so independent of the larger community. Uh, third, there is also the context of limited windows of opportunities for consistent and sustainable invo involvement of women. So even though there might be certain initiatives to involve women more, uh, these initiatives tend to be one shot rather than long-term processes. Um, outlining these uh, challenges also brings me to um, discussing some of the policy directions and some potential mechanisms uh, for women empowerment uh, in FOSS. In the first place, there is a need to rethink the learning orientation from this um, independent focus to a community thinking one. Women tend to be more inclined to participate if they are made aware of the benefits for their communities, for their families or for their grandchildren. And they tend to work better in groups rather than by themselves. Um, and it's true that teamwork is something uh, that does happen in the FOSS community. However, it seems to be dominated by people who are specializing in computer technology from a very early age. Women, on the other hand, tend to start quite late. Uh, and this is one of the disadvantages that they face in uh, joining these communities uh, at um, older ages. In the FOSS community, there is uh, the need to work by yourself quite a lot, which might be one of these big obstacles preventing women from engaging more. In the second place, there is a need for an integrated approach that would go beyond just uh, approaching uh, women into interacting with men, boys and men at different ages, and teaching them also what it means to have women involved in, uh, in the FOSS community and in the FOSS processes. Uh, and third, there is a need to create a policy-making infrastructure that gives priority also to women, as FOSS is becoming more and more used for governmental operation, and it is likely to become the standard in the future for all government websites. Uh, there is an urgent need to involve women in such processes, reaching out to segments of the population that might have differentiated needs, uh, which might have not been accounted for so far. Last but not least, there is a need for sustainable initiatives that should be ensured constant support and would enhance uh, innovation. Uh, I will stop here and I do hope that uh, we can all work towards this in the post-2015 uh, development agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roxana. Um, now the floor is uh, open for an opening discussion. Uh, if you have any questions, suggestion, an idea that you would like to share, uh, please raise your hand, uh, introduce yourself, and uh, um, uh, you, please. Hello. Thank you very much. My name is Amparo Vallivian. I work at the World Bank, and my work involves uh, exclusively supporting developing countries' clients of the bank with their open data initiatives. Uh, I have two questions, one for Ms. Lasanki and one for Mr. Sunil. Hello. The question for Ms. Lasanki is the following. I found that the use Hello. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. And, and uh, the same model, I think, could be highly useful in the countries that we're trying to support. Um, so the question is, do you see a way to involve you in our work with other countries so that you can provide them advice on how to create these multi-stakeholder groups in the developing world where open data is just initiating? And how would you go about it? Uh, and please uh, make 
I hope that I become your friend because I think that there is a long scope after this meeting to work together. Uh, and to Mr. Sunil is the following. Um, within the bank, there is an ongoing discussion. It's not bank policy yet, but we are hoping that some in the not too distant future it will become bank policy um, about whether as a matter of policy, every project that the World Bank finances in the world that finances software in one way or the other, it can be an education project, transport project, climate change, it doesn't matter because there's a myriad of sectors. And uh, we constantly are financing the development of software. So the idea is that every software that is financed with bank funds should be open free source. Uh, because what's happening is that you have, uh, say that you have a software for public budget management in Bangladesh, and the bank has a project that finances that. And then you have something that is exactly the same in uh, uh, Uruguay. Why would you want to develop the same thing twice, right? Why wouldn't you want to have a core thing and keep improving it? So that's the idea, but it's, but it's so long-winded were to ask the question, do you know of any precedents at the national level for such a policy? Okay. Um, we, we can take a few questions and after that uh, uh, you, sir, and then you, and after that you, you sir. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, is there a mic? Gentleman in the second row first, and you, Thank you, and you're the third. Thank you. My name is Nasser Kitani. I, uh, I'm the CTO for Microsoft in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, actually, a couple, one comment and one question. The comment is around the sort of confusion in the panel around open data versus open source software. I see no relationship between those, besides the fact that perhaps we can use open source software to do open data, but we don't need to do open source software to do open data. So there's, I see them as separate, different things. Uh, that's, that's one comment. The, but the, but the, the back to your question, which, which we, the point that you made about Apple, which is really interesting, about uh, the fact that Apple is actually, uh, one of their success is the fact that they're using, you know, BST. I see one of the successes of Apple is that they have one million apps in their Apple Store. And the innovation that is coming from the app store, you know, the, where, where developers go and build applications and put on the app store is fascinating. We, we have, I mean, it's, it's, it's unique in the history, probably, to some extent, in a very short time. And, and I don't know of many of those millions, of the million of apps that are open source, where actually those developers have decided to provide their intellectual property to the industry. In fact, they did not. And, and uh, many of them, and just, so they might use open source developing environment to do that. But the, but the, the point of, the, the, the matter of fact is that the code that they're providing, that the code that they are developing is not open source, which is where the innovation is coming from. So the, the point I'm trying to make is innovation can come from closed source software, from startups and giants, as you said, but also from, you know, uh, uh, and, and also, you, you know, from people that have decided to provide open source. So the question is, how do you create a sustainable environment for innovation and growth and job creation if we're looking on only at, you know, as open source as, as environment? That's, that's my question. Yep, uh, we'll, we'll take uh, one more question and then you can respond and after that, you please. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Nicolas, uh, Internet uh, Society Ambassador from Paraguay. Um, um, uh, there was a question raised by the lady from the World Bank uh, on why those kind of things happen, like uh, selling the same kind of software to 12 different countries. Uh, in our case in Paraguay, uh, it w the answer is very simple, because it's very good business for that company. 
you know, selling the same kind of software to 12 different ministries. You know, uh, uh, that's on one hand. Uh, on the other hand, um, relating, um, there was another question uh, about, uh, oh, I forgot. But uh, basically my point is uh, that the answer is, it's very good business to sell, I mean, closed software. Now, if we were talking about uh, open source software, that wouldn't have happened. You understand, especially in poor or developing countries, you know, uh, and for the representatives of those big companies that make very good business selling the same kind of, of software like 20 or 15 times, you know, to, to 12 or, or 15 different ministries. And then two or three years after, renewing, you know, the licenses, you know, re renovating, I don't know the word. Um, thank you. Thank you. Dominic, you and... To the, the gentleman from Microsoft, I just wanted to say there, I think you are touching on a point about where open is being used quite a lot between open source and open data, and I understand that, and there's a lot of confusion in general about what open means, but for the purpose of this panel, I think that there's a wider agenda that we're addressing, So, um, and that's what we've talked about, so hopefully we can address some of those other issues in order to, um, to discuss your point. But, but in a more, um, uh, on a greater point, uh, with the World Bank, I believe the World Bank has just signed an agreement, a memorandum of understanding with the Open Data Institute, um, which, do, do you know about that? I, I think it just happened. Just yeah, did you? Okay. Yeah, there's, so, there's, there's more, yep. there's yeah, okay, so, and that, a lot of that's coming out around the Open Government Partnership um, next week. Uh, however, they focus on skills building more than multi-stakeholder approaches to open data. And I think one of the things I've been talking about with um, with people in the community is that the, the open data user group is, is a group that no one really talks about outside of the community within the UK. And I think this is a problem with it. And it's one of the reasons why I talk a lot about it because it's another example of um, a multi-stakeholder approach, quite frankly. It's slightly different in that, you know, there's only a limited number of people on it. It's not open and inclusive, which in some ways I think that there probably should be a few more people on the, the group. But um, I think it is a really interesting way to deal with open data and to deal with targeting what users want versus just, you know, more a more general approach. Again, I would rather have as much data open <coughs> from the government and, as possible, but um, we really do, try to address some other issues. And so I look forward to possibly talking to you a little bit more about it after after this session. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Neil? Uh, addressing the questions that the lady from the World Bank asked, I'd like to also answer question number one. Uh, which is national open data policies. Uh, I had the good fortune to contribute through uh, UNDP to policy development in Iraq, and I facilitated the drafting of Iraq's uh, GIF, or Government Interoperability Framework, which is a pseudo uh, free software or open source software policy. And uh, more recently, I helped them uh, with their open data policy, what they call their public data policy. That's still in draft form, and uh, it would be excellent if you could uh, give us some of your feedback, given your international expertise. So I'd love to share the draft policy with you so that you could give me some support. Uh, when it comes to uh, funding the development of software, and if there, are, if there is precedent for uh, countries or uh, a group of countries mandating that when software development is funded using public resources uh, that the resultant intellectual property should be freely available to the public. I think uh, there is definitely a precedent. Uh, the NIH in the US uh, when it uh, pr uh, funds uh, health related research uh, the final academic paper has to be open access, and also the software that is developed using NIH funding also has to be 
licensed under free slash open source uh, software license. If you look at the European Union and the FP calls, uh, these uh, often result in billions of dollars of funding for research. Again, uh, it is part of the uh, contract that you sign with the European Union that the license of the software developed uh, should be under a free or open source software license. Uh, IDRC, International Development Research Center in Canada, uh, this is also part of their grant agreement. Uh, so this is now increasingly becoming a trend. But uh, I'd like to uh, request that that is not sufficient. You have to incentivize uh, standing on the shoulder of giants. You have to incentivize collaborative work. So if one of your grantees or partners is able to build their project on existing code, then there should be some incentive mechanism, ideally even financially. Uh, and only that will lead to uh, cumulative growth. Otherwise, we will have a lot of uh, code available in the public domain, but people will not be incentivized uh, to build on the work of others because uh, so far the donor community very broadly incentivizes us to be unique, not to demonstrate uh, commonness, not to, do, uh, not to behave in a cooperative fashion. So we need that additional twist uh, to the funding policy. J uh, this is now the baby step, but we need to start uh, to run. Uh, the uh, question from the gentleman uh, from Microsoft, uh, uh, years ago, when I used to work for the UNDP at the regional bureau in Bangkok, at an initiative hosted by the Asia-Pacific Development Information Program, um, the initiative was called International Open Source Network, and we did uh, free software, open content, and open standards policy work in 42 countries, from Iran to Fiji. At, at that point, uh, uh, Microsoft resisted uh, the work that was done at U UN, uh, there was uh, the idea that this is some kind of communist model, that this was uh, some kind of cancer. Uh, but today in Bangalore, at the Microsoft office, uh, the PHP community, which is a very important uh, free software community, meets for their monthly meetings. Microsoft gives cake and coffee and tea. So Microsoft is actually growing uh, the free software community in uh, India. Uh, and Microsoft also annually uh, releases millions of dollars, millions of lines of code under uh, free and open source licenses. So I was not uh, making the case that the government should mandate behavior in the market. Uh, in the market, people should be allowed to choose whatever it is that they want to choose. Uh, but when it comes to its own procurement, especially in areas of procurement which has direct implications on citizenship and direct implications on human rights, on that subset, uh, we need mandates. Because uh, if I were to be put into prison because of proprietary software, or if my government said I was no longer a citizen because of proprietary software, then I would like to reserve the right to audit that uh, software. So uh, I was making a very specific case for a very limited part of government, I'm not saying that we should run nuclear power plants on free software that has not been tested, that is not mature. Uh, I, I'm overall not for interfering with the market. I'm making a very specific case for part of the government. And this segues beautifully into uh, Nicholas, I assume, the gentleman who asked the question about how can governments prevent the same entity from selling software repeatedly to different departments or different ministries. Uh, there are two types of software. Uh, software that Microsoft produces, which we call COTS, commercial off-the-shelf software. And there you have no choice. Uh, you will have to buy it again and again. Uh, there is another category of software, which is called bespoke software. Software that is made specifically for your requirements. Uh, if you look carefully at your copyright law, national copyright law, this will come under works for hire. And if you implement that principle into the contract, then the intellectual property generated, just as is the case with World Bank and other international bilateral donors, uh, will have to be 
assigned to you. You will become the owner of the co copyright. And then based on whether it's appropriate, you can decide whether you want a proprietary license or whether you want a free and open source license. It may not be uh, always appropriate to license all the bespoke software under a free and open source license. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we, we will take uh, three more questions. Um, um, you first, and then you. Any more questions? OK. Please uh, go ahead. The gentleman in the third row. Uh, thank you. I am Arifin. I am from the Indonesian Open Source Association. Uh, we had we have had a um, conference about open source uh, April this year, and also Microsoft was, is, was one of the sponsor. So uh, uh, and I think uh, there is a, a different paradigm. Yes, uh, the uh, what Microsoft is doing uh, in 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 the name of uh, you know uh, open source. And we are very glad about that because uh, many of Indonesians still think that if we want to, to use um, open source, that means that we, have, we, we are against uh, Microsoft, isn't it? No, no? <laughs> okay, uh, my question is uh, actually uh, according to the open data. Uh, our government has announced a, a new regulation that uh, government bodies should exchange their document in ODF, open, open document format, just recently. Uh, but the, the fact is that there are still many uh, people out there in the government uh, that are using uh, another uh, format of uh, documents. So it's quite uh, a difficult implementation then. And I, I want to hear uh, your opinions, uh, especially from, uh, uh, from you. Uh, from the U.S., for you, <laughs> Dominic, right? Okay, and how how can we how can we uh, solve these problems? And uh, do you see um, uh, uh, the future of uh, open document format in 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 real sense? Then? Okay, thank you very much. I'm Prakash uh, from Malaysia, representing uh, Comas Human Rights uh, Organization. So um, just to uh, look at uh, another perspective, uh, the end user, um, there's a greater concern and worry on the software being used by activists, by a common user, that when it's closed and they don't know what the application is doing. For the second layer is the app mobile applications. It's also there's a small community uh, developing uh, open source uh, mobile apps. And also uh, the chatting applications, the code is closed. If anyone from China can raise your hand, representing the government. So of course, there's a lot of report that governments that using this web or uh, chat applications that recording all the conversations and listening or tapping or like civilians. So uh, f for us, I think the first thing we have to like promote and uh, encourage the use of free and open software. Of course, the, even the operating system, Linux-based uh, OS. And the second thing also, there should be more discussion on different stakeholders in the business of software industries, big corporations, and how they can also support uh, civil society and activists to develop open software that can help and support in their work. Of course, there's a lot of web uh, softwares are available now, like Ushahidi platforms and other mapping softwares, uh, OpenStreetMap. So uh, th these are the things. I think the, the, the concerns on the tech and activist communities, when it is closed, there's a lot, lot of higher possibility of surveillance and also tracking and using the data to prosecute uh, the activists or human rights defender themselves.
Do we have more questions? Okay. Sunil? No, I, I thought uh, since I love stories, I'll just tell my favorite Malaysian story. Uh, there's a politician in Malaysia called Jeff Ui, who used to be a blogger. He used to run a website called uh, Screenshots or something like that. Uh, he used to have a series, a network of informers. Uh, he used to call them little birds. And uh, the little birds were anonymous informers that would uh, leak to Jeff Ui stories of corporate and government corruption. And Jeff Ui used to cover these stories in his blog. Uh, so how can Jeff Ui have completely confidential, yet authenticated uh, communication with his uh, little birds uh, that is only possible using free and open source software? That would not be possible using proprietary software because uh, the little bird would not be able to independently verify either themselves or through a technically competent friend. I know the Malaysian open source community is very big. Uh, whether there is any backdoor or spyware in the encryption software that uh, he or she was using to communicate with Jeff Ui. So absolutely, uh, there are some areas of our life where it is not an option anymore. And there are some people in our societies for which it is not an op option anymore. So thank you so much for uh, bringing up this question from a human rights perspective, but uh, perhaps also to segue into the concern over uh, gender in the open source movement. It isn't as if uh, free software is emancipatory in all its dimensions. When it comes to gender, free software is even more patriarchal than uh, uh, the proprietary software world. Free software has done a lot of violence. Uh, the movement has done a lot of violence against women at its events, at its mailing lists. Uh, fortunately, some communities are becoming more sensitive. So it isn't an unqualified good. There are some serious problems. Even same thing with open content. Not enough women edit Wikipedia. So it isn't an unqualified good. It's a mostly a good thing. But there are some very dark and evil sides uh, to free software as well. Some of the most important free software hackers have joined the NSA. So the free software community is now comp building the surveillance uh, infrastructure, the global surveillance infrastructure built by the free software hackers. Dominic? So I'm going to talk about something more boring and go back to the <laughs> formats. <laughs> um, so I'd like to say that the UK government um, across central government is releasing everything in a readable format, but it's not. <laughs> and it's something that they're definitely working on. And, and obviously, we still um, you know, give them quite a hard time for releasing things in PDFs, for example. Um, however, the national information infrastructure will actually account for that and try to see where there are things that are available. Um, I know at the Taxpayers Alliance, we looked at a lot of uh, financial data that was released, spending data, and a lot of it was still in PDFs. Um, you know, and I often say in a lot of the work that I do across the central government, I advocate for what the OECD and the World Bank um, says, which is marginal cost based on the release of data. And so there's a discussion around, you know, did marginal cost cover formats, right, changing formats and releasing it in a format. Um, we do see a lot of um, Excel spreadsheets, which I'm happier with than PDFs at the moment. But the really bigger issue in the UK is local government. Um, local councils and local areas um, don't actually, they, they actually don't release data as much as central government. And part of the reason they don't do that, they don't have enough people to help them with it, which is one thing. But they're sort of afraid to release a lot of the data um, through PDFs because that's effectively all they can do. And so we're trying to encourage them from an open data user group perspective to release, to get as much out there as possible and just try to get stuff out there first and foremost before before we concern the, get concerned with the formats. But um, it's not a great answer to your question. I think you're a lot further along <laughs> than we are. But um, just so you know, I think there's we're, the ODUG, Open Data User Group, is focusing on getting data out first. And so um, we will be continuing to have a big discussion around formats so, and cost. Thank you very much. Uh, more questions? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Just want to make another comment. Uh, I would like to, you know, thank you for, for, you know, the point that you're making about, you know, our contribution to the open source community. There is a lot of confusion in the market about, you know, Microsoft, Microsoft versus open source. And, um, and I'm happy to see that you recognize that, the, as a matter of fact, that we are contributing probably more than anybody else on the industry as, you know, so-called giants to the open source community. The reality is we, uh, we release source code, we, we are more interested in interoperability, um, and we would like to be working with, with the open source communities than others and make our software interoperable with, with others. Uh, but but there's a lot of, there is a fundamental misconception about, um, uh, you know, in the open source and in, in, in the industry overall, about two things, which I would like well, to contribute. One is around the fact that we, we, as a company, we do not compete with open source as a concept. We compete with products. We compete with companies, not with, with the ideology of open source. And I want to clarify that. So for example, when we compete with, on the databases world, we compete with Oracle, the same way we compete with MySQL, which is an open source platform. So it's not, we don't compete with MySQL because it's open source. It's just because it's a, co a product that we compete against the same way we compete with Oracle and others, et cetera. I can give other examples to that. So that's, not a, that's a misconception I wanted to raise. The other misconception is the, is the concept behind the business model. Because there are different business models. There is no free lunch. And I want to make sure we agree on it. There is no free lunch. And there is no, somebody has to pay for some sort of software in a way or another. And, and when we talk about you know, th this world of open source versus commercial or proprietary, et cetera, the reality is we're talking about different business models. There are people that sell software, that are people that sell services, that are people that sell advertising, they give you the software for free. At some point of time, there is no way on earth where software is free in the sense of you, know, you don't pay for it. It's free in the sense we can change it, yeah, that's, that's one way. But, there, but it's, that's something that didn't come, up, didn't come up in this discussion, which is what's the business model behind it? You know, somebody is paying in a way or another, you know, the, the software at, at the end of the day. And for example, the, another example is, you know, we, we look into Google, for example. Google is, uh, is, is an interesting example where they use open source in their data centers, right? They don't release their search engine sort code but they sell advertising. So it's a different business model. These are different business models at the end, uh, and companies are choosing different business models uh, behind them. But, but, but the question I had, and the, the one thing I don't sort of agree with you when one statement that you said is, there are things that you do only if you have open source, uh, like the example they said. I actually, I don't agree with that uh, at all. You know, uh, and the idea that it's more secure because you have the source code, etc. I don't, just, uh, you know, you you are given the the perception that there is backdoor in proprietary software and, and the software, and that, that's not the case. They might be the case in, in some specific cases, but in most cases, there are not. Um, there is no backdoor in you know in in, in code that is not uh, open. Uh, that's that's wrong. Uh, so, I'm a great believer in uh, pluralism, uh, to have choice, and also a great believer in competition, because it uh, drives us to do better. Uh, so, one of the reasons why the open source community uh, has so much of collegial uh, feeling and camaraderie is because there is a big competitor. I often worry what will happen to the open source community if uh, Microsoft were to become an insignificant market player maybe the open source community will not, no longer be so motiv motivated. So competition is always necessarily a good thing. Uh, I'm not saying that we want to go from the hegemony of proprietary software to the hegemony of open source software. That would be terrible. Uh, free software prod products still don't sufficiently 
take into account the needs of the disabled. When it comes to accessibility by persons with disability, Microsoft is gold standard and free software is very far from there. So uh, the freedom to be a slave or the freedom to use proprietary software or the freedom to produce proprietary software is also freedoms. And uh, if the world turned into a place where you didn't have those freedoms, it wouldn't be a better place than where we are today. So uh, the competition between uh, free software products and proprietary products, free software companies and the community and proprietary players is good, healthy, necessary to raise the bar to increase uh, quality. So definitely, I agree with you there. When it comes to business models, every single business model that works for a proprietary software company can also be used in an open source software company. There is no distinction between valid, so if you go with appliances, that works in both camps. If you go with the advertising model, which is what uh, uh, Google is doing, that can work as easily for a free software company and also for a uh, proprietary software company. So there is no business model uh, that is specific only to a company that is based on free software or proprietary software. Business models, more or less, uh, I can't think of an exception, whether it's customization, consultancy, it's all usually cuts across. Uh, if you use BSD, uh, license-based uh, platforms, you can even produce proprietary software. That is also a, a possibility. On the final point, uh, we must agree to disagree. Uh, your uh, trust in the fact that your software has no backdoors or that proprietary software more generally has no backdoors is based on the principle of security through obscurity. But the uh, idea that free software could be potentially more secure is based on the principle of security through transparency. However, it does not necessarily follow that all open source software is more secure than all proprietary software. It is on a case-to-case -case basis. The only thing that free software or open source software allows for is an independent audit. Uh, there is one way around it for governments. If you're a big government and you want to be absolutely sure that the proprietary software that you're buying is free of backdoors, you can ask for either code disclosure, that is one option, uh, and this has happened uh, in many jurisdictions, or you can ask for code escrow. That means a third party will take the code from the proprietary software company and audit it for uh, vulnerabilities. So that is the uh, middle ground between security through obscurity and security through transparency. Thank you. Um, uh, do we have any questions from the remote? Okay. Um, thank you very much. As a um, conclusion, I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, stress that uh, the, the reason we are doing workshops like this or introducing the uh, open source uh, platforms, um, it doesn't mean that we um, dislike any proprietary uh, platform or we hate any of the, the companies that provide um, uh, proprietary solutions. Um, uh, it's only because we would like to introduce alternatives uh, in technology. So the people who uh, cannot access certain technology, uh, tools and applications, they are aware of uh, other at alternatives for them, especially for the developing world. Uh, it's really difficult to, to buy licenses sometimes. So the cost is uh, very important for students in order to access, let's say, the source code of a kernel so they can see how it's, uh, it's, uh, it's developed. Um, um, uh, it's not possible in some software that are proprietary closed source. So it will be more relevant for the computer science students uh, to access that code and learn from it and, uh, and possibly uh, uh, build up on that. So that's, that's the reason we, um, uh, uh, we believe in collaboration. I will agree with Sunil and other panelists that um, uh, it should be an open com uh, competitive uh, environment where, uh, as well as collaborative environment. 
we can share information, we can share experiences, uh, um, uh, and, and we can work together. Um, uh, I'd like to thank our uh, panel speakers, Dominic. Thank you very much for taking the time. Roxana, uh, you and Sunil, thank you very much for your contribution and also the, the participants for uh, for coming here in your contributions um, uh, this uh, morning uh, in the session. If you have any questions uh, or would like to share any uh, thoughts with the speakers, you can meet them after the meeting, um, the session, and um, uh, have a, um, a good day. Thank you very much.